say when. Got it. Okay. So what I wanted to talk about today is the difference between stained glass and painted glass. Because typically, if you tell anybody, hey, that's some gorgeous stained glass, what you're thinking of, what they're thinking of may or may not be, you know, the things that you see in the, the churches with the, the beautiful different colors and the painting. Um, a lot of people say stained glass and they actually mean just the colored glass. So kind of a difference between what stained glass is versus what painted glass is, is what I'm wanting to talk about because there is a difference. Um, so <clears throat> first of all, uh, let's see here. What exactly is painted glass? Well, glass, it, painted glass is a piece of glass that has been painted with a vitreous paint. And I'm going to show you an example real quick. Uh, that is painted glass. It's just glass, vitreous paint. What is vitreous paint? Vitreous paint is paint that is made. It consists of finely ground glass, which is called glass frit, charcoal, and a powdered pigment oxide. And in this case, it's actually lead. Um, so the, it actually begins in a powdered form. Um, what you do is you have to mix it by hand to the correct consistency. And you use gum Arabic as a binder. I guess I didn't open that one up. Uh, but you use gum Arabic as a binder. Um, once you get it to uh, a nice thickness, then you mix it with water. And the water is what you use to get to the correct consistency for your painting. Um, getting the proper ratio is important because if you use too little of the gum arabic or too much of the gum arabic, it's either going to flake off and brush off very easily. You can't see my hand motions. I talk with my hands. Um, or it's going to be very difficult to do your remove when you get to the shading uh, and highlighting portion of your painting. If you use too much, it can make it extremely difficult to remove. Um, so you either repaint it or you just power through and just work through it really difficult. Um, so I do want to note that the paint that I use today um, is from a company called Ruche, but the combination that is used to make this paint is the same paint that was used historically. There's not been any change to it. It works great. Um, so it's it's the same thing as when they painted any of the glass in any of the cathedrals. Um, so I do wanna note though, because it's lead, it is very highly toxic. So typically when you're painting, you don't wanna eat, drink, stick your hands in your face, in your eyes or anywhere like that because over time it can build up. So what happens is the vitreous paint um, is painted onto the glass and then you fire it in a kiln. And around 1230 degrees Fahrenheit, what happens is the glass that you've painted on, as well as the paint, which has the glass for it in, in it, um, they fuse together. So the paint becomes part of the glass. You can feel it. There's like usually a, a raised area I can show you a picture of that, make sure I opened the correct one. Um, here's an example of what that's gonna look like. As you see um, along the edges of this leaf, you can kind of see where that has a, a it's kind of raised. So there's a little bit of texture there. This is just uh, vitreous paint that has been painted and then fired in the kiln. Like I said, this is fused together. It's not going to wash off. You can't scratch it off. Um, it's just, it is, it is there. It's always going to be there. The only way that it's going to be that is if you actually chip it. And when you chip it, you're going to break the glass. So it's a moot point anyway. Um, so once it's there, it's there. Um, so that is what painted glass is. Um, the other thing is stained glass. And again, there's the misconception that, that stained glass is all glass, but it's not. Um, I wanna give you a little history real quick um, about stained glass. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, stained glass actually was, um, was discovered in Islamic land, so in Egypt around the eighth century. But it didn't actually come into, I guess you could say, uh, 
constant use um, until much later. What happened is in 1243, King Alonso X of Castile um, acquired a manuscript called the El Lapidario, and he had it translated into Italian. So this translation was how to create stained glass. Um, with that, it didn't actually start appearing in glass. The actual stain didn't start appearing in glass until around 30, 13 years later in Normandy, which would have been around 1313. So 14th century is when stained glass really, the actual stain for stained glass really came into being. So prior to this, stained glass was actually more of a colored glass, colored glass window. But because of this technique, it became so popular uh, so widely sought after, it actually changed the whole terminology that you used with stained glass, and it's now called stained glass across the board. So what happened is with this really cool process, um, instead of having a clear glass and then maybe a blue or red or green border of a different piece of glass, you now can get a couple of different colors of glass out of the same piece of glass. You've got your clear glass, you stain it, and now you have clear and yellow. Uh, you can put stain on blue glass and have a blue and green. Um, so there are just, you could, there's a, it opens up much more possibilities. Um, here is an example of, and I'll go into this in just a second, of stained glass, a piece that I had worked on maybe if I remember to open it. I'm not nervous or anything either in case you couldn't tell. Uh, well, I know it's open. Sorry guys. No worries. I'm real new to this. So this is an example of a piece of stained glass. It's for a project that I did a couple of years ago. Um, and what this is, it shows you the painted side and the non-painted side. Um, so what happens is like with the viscous paint that goes, the vitreous paint that goes on top of the glass, um, this is also painted on top of the glass. However, it's silver nitrate. So the silver nitrate is mixed with clay. And honestly, the mixing it with clay is just so that it makes it easier that you can see where you're painting. Um, clay and oil, now historically, they, could, they would also use vinegar or water. However, I found that with, stain, with silver stain, um, a combination of oils is what I use because it doesn't dry out as fast and it's easier to to work with so it creates the this paintable medium you paint it onto your glass and then you put that into the kiln as well now with the vitreous paints i had mentioned that it was around uh, 1230 1250 degrees is where you're going to have that this is going to fire at a little lower temperature it's going to be around a uh, thousand and fifty degrees anywhere from a thousand fifty to a thousand eighty it really depends on the paint and your kiln mine go that goes at a thousand fifty so what happens is when that heats up in the kiln an ionic exchange happens and the silver nitrate nanoparticles actually uh, do this ionic exchange with uh, a portion of the glass. So that's the easiest way to explain it. If you want to get really, really technical, uh, I can tell you that. So what happens is the ionic exchange, and I'm going to read this part here. I know it, but I just want to read it because it's easier. So the ionic exchange, uh, the silver ions with the alkali ions, which is going to be either sodium or potassium uh, from the glass, it causes a diffusion in the glass. And then the, the re results in a reduction of the metal and then the growth of the silver nanoparticles. So basically, like I said, the silver nanoparticles exchange with the particles of the glass, the silver at that point is actually inside of the glass. So it's not sitting on top, but it's actually inside of the glass. Um, the thickness really kind of depends um, This the how much that is. It's actually a very, very thin uh, layer of glass. You can see here on the left is the top of the glass where I've painted on the and then you have to stain on the bottom of the glass. That's that picture that's on the right. That's why from an angle, it looks off. Um, I happen to have 
a piece of glass that actually chipped off uh, that I can show you to just to kind of show you just how thin that that really is. I mean, we're talking between 10 and 300 nanoparticles thick. It is super, super thin. That's a piece of glass that chipped off right there. Um, and where it chipped off from. If I can figure this out. Sorry, let's see. Open. Oh, I'm not doing very good at this. And this little area, if you look in the right, can you see where I'm pointing to? Um, in the very center of the picture on the very edge, there is uh, one little seed that doesn't have any coloring on it. And that little piece that chipped off, chipped off from right here. So it is super, we're talking paper thin is, is really how thin that was. Um, so the thing about using silver stain um, when you're doing stained glass is you have to do your painting first. It has the higher temperature. Uh, you do your painting first. And like I said, it has that raised feel. Silver stain, because of that ionic exchange that it does, um, if you stain on top of paint, it can't do that. The paint actually blocks the stain. So you flip the glass over and then you stain on the back side. Now with that, um, there is something that you have to be cognizant of. Modern glasses, typically when they're, when modern glass is made, it is floated on a bed of liquid tin. So when this glass is floated on liquid tin, it changes the chemical composition of one side of your glass. So you have a non-tin side, and then you have a tin side of your glass. You need to know before you stain which side you're painting or staining on because it, that tin will um, actually change the color of your stain. Um, and as an example of that, open and then share. Here is an example. I took two pieces of glass and cut them in half. And I did this twice just because I had two different pieces of glass I was trying to test. And this was when I was first learning and uh, wanted to see the differences. So the very top image with the lighter color, now this is the same exact stain used on all four pieces of glass. I did it all at the same time. So the top color is your non-tin side. So that actually reacted the way that I expected it to with a nice yellow color. The second image, um, down with the darker orange is actually the tin side. So that silver nitrate has reacted with the tin that the, the glass was rolled and made flat on and it gives it a darker color. So it really gives you an opportunity, um, you know, most of the time I want this yellow, the lighter yellow color, but if for some reason um, I wanted a darker orange color instead of buying a second color of stain, I can just use the other side and get that darker color. So you have a lot of uh, op uh, uh, different things, options that you can do with that. Um, silver nitrate, just like the uh, vitreous paint is also toxic. Um, it is corrosive. Like I said, silver, it does have the silver nitrate in it. It's super corrosive and um, it will, unless you're using oils, it will cause your brushes to, uh, deteriorate very very quickly question so, if I may. i'm sorry question if i may okay how do, you, how do you mark your sheets of glass i'm assuming you have to uh you have to run a test on them to i do um just a moment i've got a i have a um ultraviolet light let me grab it and i'll show it to you i actually started to do a water test when I first started, I was told that there was a water test that you could do where you drop water on your glass and the tin side and the non-tin side will react differently. So on one side, the water will spread out and on the other side, it won't. Well, I tried that um, and thought I had found the non-tin side and then did my project. And um, 
it was not right. I had gotten the exact same results on both sides of the glass, which is really strange. But you can use an ultraviolet glass uh, light. It looks like this. Um, like I said, ultraviolet. When you shine it, do I have a piece? I don't know if you're gonna be able to see this, um, but when you shine it onto the glass on either side, um, the, the side that has, I don't think it's gonna show, but the side that has the tin actually looks very milky white, um, almost, almost opaque. The non-tin side is just gonna show clear. So I test this on every piece first, and then I just put a little mark in the top and know which side that I need to use at that point. It makes it really easy. Thank you. You're welcome. Wow, my hour long class and I've only used 20 minutes. Um, but basically, yeah, that is the difference between painted glass and stained glass. Stained glass now really refers to all of it because like I said, staying the, the technique of silver staining so popular and um, uh, so widely used that everybody just started calling it all stained glass when in actuality, not all of it truly is. Um, and a picture of stained glass that actually has no paint on it at all um, would be this. This is considered stained glass. Um, and it's just a clear gloss. And that's actually part of the progression, which would kind of be another another class is where stained glass actually or colored glass started off as colored. Um, and then just gradually um, you added the, the they started doing the painting um, around 600. So are there any other questions? Surely there are. Okay, hi. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Okay, this is Hillary. Hi. Um, hi. We 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 eventually will meet sometime down in Rebecca's area. Oh, I know. Uh, when it's warm and we can get back to playing with glass. Um, so, um, have you ever used Thompson enamels for stained glass? I, I know, how do you say the other one, Rocher? Rocher? Rocher. Yeah, Roche, Rocher is actually what I use. And I used Rocher in some classes mundanely. Okay. Um, I had, a, had a very lucky opportunity to take a class with Peter McGrain, who's one of the well-known mm -hmm. uh, stained glass painters. Yeah, he actually sells a little kit too that has yeah. like everything that you need to get started in it. But yeah, Roche is actually what I use and it right. does come as a powder. Right. So um, when you mix it, you can use either gum Arabic in powder form or in liquid form. And I prefer the liquid form. That was what I was taught. And it, I think it's easier to control how much you're putting in. I did buy some of the Thompson's years ago when okay. I just bought a whole bunch of sample sets. And I didn't realize at the time it was for stained glass or I did. I don't remember which. So one of these days um, when we are together, I will try to remember to bring some and maybe I can give you some samples. Oh, that would be fun. I actually have not used any of the enamels yet. The enamels are much more uh, towards later, almost out of, well, out of period for what we do in the SCA. So I haven't, I've looked at them and I have some plans for the future, but I haven't really gotten into them yet. I pretty much have used just the, the paints and the stains. Okay. And then another question. Um, have you tried using any of this on glassware, like the German painted glasses, uh, goblets, that kind of thing? Oh, the goblets. So you're talking more like the luster glass. Um, I'm I'm thinking of some of the glass that I think was mostly up in the Germanic area that was painted with little florals and vine. It's not solid painted like a solid color it's decorative painted um they have goblets and mugs and it's uh, not ceramic it's clear glass that right. has color paint designs on it i have not tried that yet um it actually sounds like it would be a lot of fun um but i haven't tried that yet mine pretty much at this point has just been all on just glass so, um, I do know that a lot of beads were made that way as well. Um, I've never 
I think I've made one bead my entire life and I think it would be kind of fun. I think Hennessy was looking into doing some of that though. And so when you're firing your glass, you're, are you starting from a cold kiln up I, to hot and then back down to cold? Yes. Otherwise the uh, glass will shock. Exactly. I start mine in a cold kiln, um, put it in. It has, uh, my firing schedule has for regular paint has five different uh, stages that it goes through. It goes up, it hits its mark. Um, I, for my paint, I let it soak for about five minutes and soaking just means uh, leaving it that temperature. Um, I let it soak for five minutes and then I let it come back down naturally. It, it cuts off at that point, uh, the heat does, and then it comes back down. The annealing uh, takes, you know, as it's coming down, it's annealing the glass. And I think with having it come down naturally like that, the annealing, I think is just better than, than quickly because it's stronger. It's not going to shock as easily. What kind of kiln do you use? Oh, shoot. I mean, how, well, I guess how big is it also? Okay, I, I know. mine is an 18 by 18, which okay. is huge. Yeah. Um, and it is deep. Uh, so that's kind of, that's one thing too, is because my kiln is so much deeper, it takes it longer to cool off right. uh, than some of the things, like, like John, John's kiln is not as deep as mine. Um, so his firing may only, t I don't even remember how long he said it took, but it didn't take as long with the, with the cool down and everything. I think mine takes a couple of hours longer than his does because it's so much deeper. I have two ones like, <clears throat> both of them are more for jewelry. Mm -hmm. uh, one was for PMC. So they're definitely smaller. It's like six by six. And then the other one is uh, maybe seven by eight. But yeah, the one at school, the biggest one we have at, at my art school that I take class at is 16 by 16. So mm -hmm. yours is definitely. But when I took class with Peter McGrain, they had scuts. Oh, yeah. Oh, those are fun. I, I am wanting to try one. I, I question the, how well it anneals because it cools off so quickly. Uh, it, it worked great in class. Mm -hmm. we, we did the first layer and then we came back and added another layer during the same day. So it worked. Wow. Yeah. 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 That would be great. See, that would be, uh, it's, it's 10 hours for mine from start to taking it out is, right. is 10 hours. Um, so that would be, that would be kind of neat. Uh, and yeah. then I guess my last question is flash glass. Because oh, yeah. I, know, I know, I don't know it, have, have it, I don't think I've done the research yet to find out how much in period it is or out of period because I know they used flash glass a lot it for is. heraldry mm -hmm. um, because they could remove the color um, by sandblasting or whatever. Uh, That's acid. Right. Yeah. So yeah. do you know anything about flash glass? Yeah, the flash glass is really neat because, um, and they did use it quite a bit as a way to save money because they could take a more expensive color like reds or blues, purples, greens, whatever, and then just apply a very thin, thin layer to their clear glass. Um, so you have your glass, but now you have what appears to be, you know, a solid piece of green, blue, whatever. It's like a sandwich. Of it a is almost, of it is. I actually have a piece. Let's see if I can, I don't know if I can get, I can't get it out of the window. Um, but I do have a really nice piece of it that John made for me. It's blue and white. And then when you sandblast it, the, well, clear. And when you sandblast it, uh, the white, it becomes more of a white color. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, they did use that, like I said, as a way to, to really save some money. Um, because with a, a thin coating of a colored glass versus an entire piece from the colored glass, it would make a, a huge difference in cost. And I don't know when they started that. I'm thinking later period, maybe 1500s. Yeah, I'm going to have to look because I don't really know. I haven't played with it a whole lot. I can look at pictures um, and you can see where uh, flash glass has been used. Um, I have a, let's see if I can find it real quick. I have a picture um, <laughs> of an arc. I may not be able to find it. I have too many pictures on my computer. <laughs> oh, it's crazy. Join the, join um, the crowd. <laughs> right. Um, but like, this, let's see, come on, open for me. Okay, now let me share you. So the red on this arc, if you look at it closely, you can see that, especially around the door uh, in the middle, 
it looks like it's two-tone red and white. And that is actually flash glass that's been used on that. And that's from Chartres Cathedral, which is 14th century. Okay. So it goes back a little earlier than I thought it did. Yes. I'll have to research that. Yeah. So that, that was a good example that I had right there. I'm glad I had that. Yay. <laughs> Um, are there other questions? Maybe? Yes, hello. Hi. Um, what resources can I look into for researching and getting started in period stained glass and glass making? Okay, so are you wanting to just start reading about it? Yeah, I can't really do any work in my apartment right now. I understand that completely. Let me grab this book. So <clears throat> um, there is a book that has a great part uh, section in it. It is called On Diverse Arts. It's by Theophilus. Now Theophilus wrote this, and this is actually a, a period text, but he has a section in here. Um, he has other things as well, but there is a great section um, about the period aspect of making stained glass that's in here, and it's in two different sections, because it also goes into how to make cane. Um, but this is a great start. Um, online, there is, um, there's a website, it's, oh goodness. Williams and Byrne, let me find them real quick for you. Um, they are stained glass makers that are over in Wales and they are, they are top of the line. Is that who John went to go study with? It is. I meant, I think he told me, but I forgot. So. Yes. They actually have classes online. They do podcasts. Um, they have a couple of books that are fairly inexpensive um, that you can read that I, I refer to them a lot, actually. Um, is there somewhere that I can paste a link? Chat. The chat. Okay, let's see. Um, and there's somebody else that does online classes from over in England, but I'll have to look it up. Okay, uh, let's see. There is the link for Williams and Byrne. Like I said, they do have a book um, that you can get. A lot of stuff is online. Uh, they also have, I think they've got a YouTube channel. Um, and you can start off with all of those as well. I got really lucky. I had an amazing guy that started teaching me. So uh, He's not on here, but you know, Jahan's laughing, I'm sure. Oh, there she is. Yep, I'm here. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> let's see. So this was really about the differences in the two. Um, if you are going to want to start painting Fal Falco, right? Um, I would definitely do some reading online. Um, and that book will help as well. The, the book is really gonna give you a lot of the historical reference to it. Um, you, feel free to reach out to me anytime you want to. Here, let me put my information and anybody can reach out to me anytime they want to. It may take me a couple hours to respond, but I'll respond. There you go. So I just posted my email address and my Facebook. Um, There's Facebook. also a um, Stained Glass Association of America and they do a lot of conservation work, which would be interesting for people who want to look at some of the historical because a lot of the early American stained glass was still made the same way it was done um, in Europe. So a you know, little later, but much hasn't changed. Right. Um, 
some of the later period stained glass for later period for our period stained glass um, is very similar to the early Victorian stuff. I actually have a project that I recently finished that um, there are pieces that look almost exactly like it in the Met. And then I found another piece that was considered early Victorian. So either they're wrong in their dating or it's just very similar, so. Personally, my favorite is the Grisel pieces, which are not really the lots of colored pieces of glass, but the, um, the um, using the stain. Um, so more of the stained glass pieces, stained, silver stained, uh, yellows and stuff like that. That's, that's more like what I like to do anyway, my favorite. So when you're adding your shadow ink, are you doing like a white layer and then an uh, alcohol layer? Mm -mm. No, nope, I don't use alcohol at all. I don't use propylene glycol. Uh, I only use uh, the paint with the gum arabic and water and then mm -hmm. that's it. So when I'm doing my shadowing, um, of course you put your, you apply a base coat to the glass before you do any painting because otherwise your paint won't stick to it. So you have, and the base coat can be very light or very dark or anywhere in between, uh, depending on how you want to, to do your, how dark you want your shading. Um, here is like, this is the Wisenberg Christ. And this is my example of the, my, my first try at the Wisenberg Christ. This is, uh, the Wisenberg Christ is actually the oldest uh, known image of a person in stained glass. Uh, so with this piece, I started off with a very dark base coat, and then I painted um, all of, I painted the face in full, and then once I painted the face is when I started going through and removing sections to do my highlights and the shading. So, and I used a scratching stick, um, which is just a, a piece of wood with a point on it. I used an awl for some of the finer things. Um, I used uh, Q-tips are really good for moving, especially on his face where there's a lot of the, the area that's been removed. And even for the little bitty tiny areas around his eye, like those pointed Q-tips are really good for that. Um, so then you just remove it and, and reverse. So you paint everything and then remove as you need it. So can you explain to people who may be unfamiliar, this is not like adding, like painting a scroll? It is not. Instead, you're doing a reverse process. That is correct. So when you paint your scroll, um, you start off with a lighter color um, when you're with your paints, and then you build up from the lighter color to the darker color, adding your highlights as you go. This is completely opposite. It's it's think of a photograph in reverse is what you're trying to create basically. So when you add your your black uh, wash, then the rest of it is removing instead of adding paint. Right. You add the, the black background, you do paint on your image. Right. Um, and those are called, Lighting. yeah, so there's flood lines, there's flooding, uh, trace lines is how you put your image on, and then you remove everything else that you don't want. I even use my finger on part of this, which you're not really supposed to, uh, just because you, it has lead and you don't really want that contact with your hand. But it also, your finger is really good for removing paint. <laughs> <laughs> Don't just don't put it. it just don't put it in your face on your face or your mouth right yeah they make these commercial wipes called d wipes that's really good for removing that because it removes heavy metals from your from skin and from contact uh, from surfaces i keep them on my desk and every time you know i do anything it's just immediately wipe it off um i know i know a couple of people that use gloves the whole time i have found that i don't like doing that because mm -hmm. I, the feel is different for me I, I work with enamels on metal. Um, okay. And so for stained glass people who are working with lead or enamelists or any other artists who are working with something with lead, mm -hmm. if you're doing it a lot professionally, especially once a year, you need to go get your lead levels tested for your blood. Um, right. Your blood. So that's just a safety thing. Yeah. I don't think I work with it quite enough to do that, but yeah. I have thought about, about doing that. Yeah, just just a, it's been you know three or four years now and three I think three years now and just just to check. Yep. So. 
Yeah, I looked up the website on YouTube for Williams and Byrne. Stephen Byrne is the person that I had seen uh, before. I've already got him earmarked for subscription. So, okay. Yeah. So that's the same guy. I was curious if it was the same one that John had gone to take classes with. He's very, very thorough. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. And John's amazing too. I mean, he can sit and I know a lot of the technical details. I tend to simplify them, over, overly simplify them. And John can definitely go into the dark rabbit holes of all of the details. <laughs> It's great. You learn a lot. It's a lot to take in, though. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Um, let's see. What else? Earlier stained glass um, kind of is looks strange to the modern eye just because earlier stained glass, most of their animals and people looked very derpy. Um, and they're supposed to look that way. That's just how they painted them then. Um, so there's a huge difference in a very derpy looking kind of guy versus something that's a little bit later in period where it's maybe not quite so much derpy. Uh, <laughs> John specializes in the derp and I like later period stuff. So we kind of, you know, complement each other okay. <laughs> I could stop the recording now if you wanted and we could just chat until the time's up. Is that good? Mm -hmm. All right. I think so. <laughs>